Lia Silverstein used to have breakfast every single morning, official, officially accepted, in a restaurant at the top of one of the Twin Towers. I think it's called the Top of the World Restaurant or something. Now, can you just think what day he might have missed? <laughs> eh? Because, he said, his wife had got him a dermatology appointment. And he said it saved his life. No, what saved your frickin' life, darling, is you knew what was coming and you didn't give a shit. That's what saved your frickin' life. And what's that? No empathy, no remorse. Archontic personality. Attar, Muslim fanatic, according to his American girlfriend, widely quoted, he um, loved pork chops, used cocaine very liberally, and was anything but a Muslim fanatic. And this is Aaron Russell, award-winning film producer. Uh, and be before he died, he started speaking out about the conspiracy and what he knew about it. And he told a story of meeting Nick Rockefeller. Rockefellers, Rothschilds, they're all involved in this. Um, and how Nick Rockefeller tried to uh, get him into the, into the the circle, recruit him. And he said this when he met Nick Rockefeller. This was about a year, around a year uh, before 9-11. He said that Nick Rockefeller told him there would be an event that would lead to the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq to take over the oil fields and establish a base in the Middle East. Rousseau would see uh, soldiers looking in caves in Afghanistan and Pakistan for Osama bin Laden. There would be an endless war on terror where there's no real enemy. The whole thing would be a giant hoax. The people have to be ruled, he said, and the population reduced by at least half. Plans for uh, mass microchipping of the serfs, he also talked about. That's the truth. And of course, at 9-11, they put a, a memorial, classic frickin' Saturn, a memorial to the victims. And then there's another version of this, uh, which I call no problem reaction solution, where you don't need a problem that's real, you need a perception of a problem that you can use in ex as an excuse to offer the solutions. Um, and they are climate change uh, caused by human activity, global warming, they are weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and all that stuff. All the time we are getting no problem reaction solutions as well. And the, the, the antidote to this problem reaction solution, create the problem, get the reaction offer the solutions to the problems you've created is who benefits? Who benefits from me accepting the official version of this? And invariably, who will benefit is anyone that wants to take on this uh, uh, conspiracy, this uh, agenda, which I'm going to describe in some detail as we go along here. Alongside problem reaction solution, there's what I call the totalitarian tiptoe, where you go to your long focus goal but you go in steps so you don't alert too many people of the direction you're going until you're there and it's a done deal and then it doesn't really matter. Um, this is a classic totalitarian tiptoe where we went from a free trade area to a centralized fascist, communist, bureaucratic dictatorship, which we have now. And it was th what we have now was planned from the start. But if they'd have said that at the start, people would have been outraged. So they've done it in steps, calculated. This is Jean Monnet, a founding father of the EU, they call him and a Rothschild frontman, in a letter to a friend, uh, what, uh, the day after I was born, in 1952. Europe's nations should be guided towards the super state without their people understanding what is happening. This can be accomplished by successive steps, each disguised as having an economic purpose, but which will eventually and irreversibly lead to federation. It's been a stitch up from the start, and everything else is a smokescreen. So we went from the USSR, oh, USSR, fear, fear, to the U EU SSSR. And the only difference is, really, that they've got a uh, European Parliament that gives it the, the, the coating of democracy when it's got no power at all, and the rest of it is bureaucratic dictatorship. And another totalitarian tiptoe has been the constant expansion of centralization of power around the world to the point where long ago it was given a name, globalization. And the idea is to create interdependence between all nations so you have a loss of independence um, of running your own affairs because you are constantly uh, in hoc or, or looking to other people 
to do things that you can't do for yourselves. That's the idea, interdependency. And this is the, the structure that they want. And the whole thing is about centralizing power. The more you centralize power, clearly the fewer people have control over more and more people. You centralize more, even fewer people have control over even more people. And what happens is the more you centralize power, the more you power you have centrally to uh, centralize even quicker. And so centralization uh, of power goes faster and faster and faster because of that sequence. They want a world government that would dictate to every country. In fact, they want the end of countries. They want a world central bank that would dictate all global finance. They want a world single currency that would be purely electronic, no cash, um, for which there are massive implications for freedom. If you go into a shop now and you, you ask for um, something and you say, I'll pay with a credit card, electronic money, and they say, no, sorry, won't accept your card, you can still pay cash. When there's no cash, what that decides dictates if you can buy and what you buy and all the rest of it. Um, they, they want a world army to impose the will of the world government, and that is NATO. Way back in the 1990s, I was saying, watch for NATO. So, as, the, as the man said, as the man said I've, I've been to the top of the mountain and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. I'll freaking get there with you. I'll get there freaking with you. I'm not going until this change, this transformation is over. I've invested too much of my life in this. But if you talk about destruction, don't you know you can count me out? We don't have to fight. Critical thinking is not the manifestation of red mist. We need to stay calm. We need to stay in the heart. You don't fight for peace, you peace for peace. All the reasons I've talked about. I'm no longer accepting things that I cannot change. It's time to change things that I cannot accept and not accept anything less. Be a loose cog in the machine and the machine will cease to function. Stop cooperating if no one, uh, no one rules, if no one obeys. That's the point. And there's billions of us being oppressed by a few. If we stop uh, cooperating with our own oppression, the game is over. Unthinking respect for authority is the greatest enemy of truth. Look at it. What if these, these sheep, these goats, whatever they are, refused to cooperate with these two? What would these two do? They would know what to do. It's all over. And uh, this is a great quote from Gandhi. Don't cooperate with evil, he said. You assist an evil system most effectively by obeying its orders and decrees. An evil system never deserves such allegiance. Allegiance uh, to that means uh, partaking of this evil. A good person will resist an evil system with his or her own soul. We need to stop cooperating with our own enslavement together and it will be over. It's our cooperation with our own enslavement that makes it possible. What happens if they stop complying, Mom? We're fucked! <laughs> <laughs>